connected. Okay, we are live recording. Welcome everybody. Um, so, we also, just to let you know, um, there is a Q&A in the, in the WebEx um, interface. I ask that you please use the chat box rather than Q&A. It's much easier uh, for our moderators to see that. And also, everyone is muted on entry, so just be aware of that. There will be no discussion. Um, we will be doing everything via the chat box, so thank you for cooperating with that. Now, at the end of this talk, we will be opening up a survey. We want to know what you thought of the webinar. We want to know what you learned, what you plan on doing with the information that you, that you have, um, that you've learned. And we also, in order to, to provide this survey, we have to ask for your consent. So this is a, a part of a research study. So basically, any time that we as researchers interact with humans, we need to follow certain protocols. So we need your consent to ask these questions. Here is a slide. Why is this study being done? Why am I being asked? What will I be asked to do? Please read it. Um, if you have any questions, you can contact me, Amy Rowe at Rowe at njas.ruckers.edu. Um, but all we're doing is just we want to learn what you learned. We want to know what you thought of the quality of the program and also what you plan on doing with the information that, that you have seen here today. So that's all we're asking. We will not be asking any personal information or anything like that. So please take a look at this. So the very first question of the survey will be, do you consent to be part of this study? So you can say yes, or you can participate in the poll. So we'll get to that at the end. So also, I wanted to let you know that this program is free, uh, but we will um, have a donation website available if you are interested in possibly um, funding some of our environmental stewards programming, some of our uh, environmental projects. Uh, so I will provide the link in the chat, but please consider a donation if you've enjoyed this webinar series. It would, it would mean a lot to us, and it would go very far in funding all kinds of environmental projects, our environmental stewards projects, as well as our, um, you know, our research and everything that we do here. So I'll put that in the chat box later. So please consider that. But now, without any further ado, I will get to our dear colleague, Mike Haberland. He is the county agent for uh, Cumberland, or no, I'm sorry, Burlington and Camden County. And he is, so he's way down south while I'm way up north. Uh, and he has been the agent for 10 years now, I believe, but before that he worked for the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection for a long time. So he knows all about water quality, all about lakes, all about all kinds of things. Uh, so please welcome our expert, Mike Haberland, and he will talk to you about harmful algal blooms and everything that we need to know about lakes for this coming summer. So take it away, Mike. Uh, thank you, Amy. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, so tonight, uh, now Amy said we're going to talk about harmful algal blooms. We're actually going to talk about cyanobacteria blooms because uh, that's what they are. They are not algae, and that's what we're going to learn about tonight. So um, let's start out. This is the uh, pond that uh, I've done a lot of work with uh, in Haddonfield. And it's a, it's a gorgeous pond. A lot of uh, the town folks love to use it, like so many of our lakes and ponds in the state. Um, however, uh, 10 years ago, it used to look like this in the summertime. Um, uh, major cyanobacteria blooms. Uh, at, at that time, uh, one of the highest levels of toxicity in the state. Uh, that's since been surpassed. Uh, and uh, so I got called in uh, because there was a fish kill, and uh, this looks actually uh, 
looked like I stepped into the Wizard of Oz and uh, entered the Emerald City. This was a, uh, it, the picture doesn't do it justice. It was a, uh, uh, just a vivid emerald color. But let's talk about, we're talking about cyanobacteria and it's often called blue-green algae. It is not an algae. However, it's a very primitive microorganism and it was the first organism to give off oxygen on Earth uh, to uh, start working, getting our atmosphere going to what we have today. It's, they're very old, 3.5 billion year old fossils. They're the oldest fossils on Earth. And again, they are not an algae. They are uniquely classified as cyanobacteria. And they contain two pigments for photosynthesis, a, a bluish pigment, phycocyanin, which is what gives it the blue-green color. And they also have chlorophyll A, which is what uh, the normal, uh, the plants that we're all familiar with have. Uh, they're an aquatic uh, critter and uh, uh, an adaptation that they have is that they can re regulate uh, their buoyancy. So they can move up and down in the water column uh, by changing uh, the amount of gas they have in their, let's call it a buoyancy compensator if you're a scuba diver. Uh, so they can stay in their optimum light intensity. They can also uh, outcompete other or, or algae uh, because they can tolerate lower light levels. So if your lake has a lot of sediment or it has a lot of organic matter in it that blocks the light and other algae can't uh, live as well, uh, cyanobacteria uh, do very well. They also store phosphorus as a nutrient and along with uh, many other plants. So what do they like uh, that, that creates these bloom conditions? So they like warm, calm water with a low flow, again, because they can regulate their buoyancy. So if the water is rushing through, they, they just get uh, kicked all over the place. So that's not what they prefer. They like something that's warm and calm and doesn't move too fast. So uh, lakes and ponds are the main areas uh, that you find them. Uh, they like strong sunlight. So all of these things are, are leading into why we see them appear in, in bloom form uh, during the summer. Uh, they're there all year round, but in the summertime, all these conditions uh, come together, which just really stimulates them. They like elevated nutrient levels, especially with phosphorus. Uh, so the New Jersey level for impaired uh, water is 0.05 parts per million. So even if you meet that level, which is considered a good thing, cyanobacteria will be blooming before that. They, they, they only need 0.03 parts per million of phosphorus to uh, reproduce and form uh, blooms. So uh, they're very tough to deal with. So how can we uh, determine if we have a bloom or, or what does a bloom look like? What, what should we be looking out for? So uh, the water is not going to look normal. It's not going to look, well, it might look normal for your area, but um, it's not going to look healthy. So it's going to have either a green paint-like scum, uh, a pea soup look to it, green streaks in the water, green blobs in the water column, or some species look like clumps of mown grass. So this is the, the thick paint looking, and this is a very common appearance. Uh, this is microcystis, uh, one of the uh, main toxic uh, cyanobacteria. Uh, this is a pea soup look. This is Anabina at uh, Smithville Lake in East Hampton. 
This is another uh, look at uh, microcystis. So this is before, as it's building, each of these little dots is a, a cluster of cells. And as they reproduce, the clusters combine and they form streaks. And eventually, they, if it, the nutrients, the temperature, the light is all uh, adequate for them to keep growing, all these eventually keep multiplying and grow together and form that paint-like scum at the surface. Uh, and this is looking down in the water column. So all these dots are actually just under the surface. And a lot of this is happening not throughout the water column, but within uh, a foot or, or two of the surface. So uh, they find a level, a light level they like, and uh, they just aggregate there. Uh, this is a phanazomenon, and this is sort of the uh, grass-like structure that you can, some of the forms they take in. Now, this is groupings of individual filaments. So these are hundreds of thousands of individual filaments all grouping together to look like this. So on the left-hand side in this slide, this is uh, microcystis, so very small, you know, these circular colonies. And again, you can see where they combine together uh, uh, to form larger and larger groups. And as they keep forming larger groups, they, they form these large bloom scenarios. And on the right is a phanazomenon. And these are, it's made up of individual filaments. So the cluster that you see at the bottom is actually many, many, many filaments like we see in the top slide. And it's interesting, if you chill the water, the filaments come together into that grass-like or ropey-like structure. But if you warm the water, um, and it doesn't have to be that hot, maybe you know, 95 degrees, these filaments just all separate, and it all go, they all go into individual filaments. Uh, this is Anabina. Uh, it has a new name now, Dolocospermum. I like Anabina much better. It's easier to pronounce. Uh, this is what was at uh, Smithville Lake. And you can see, uh, I've highlighted here these uh, what we call akinetes. These are uh, structures to help it survive in harsh conditions. So what if you're at a water body and uh, you're not sure, you see it, the water looks green. Uh, how could you tell uh, if it is a cyanobacteria? Well, there's uh, a simple test that works probably more often than not, and that's to collect a sample of it in a clear glass jar and place it in the refrigerator for an hour. As the water chills down, the cyanobacteria will move up to the surface, and any if it's green algae, they'll sink to the bottom. So you can see uh, this is a sample from Hopkins Pond from the year when we had the high blooms. And you can see that uh, almost everything in that sample is cyanobacteria. One unique characteristic of many of the cyanobacteria, usually it's a, a, in the filamentous forms, is their ability to fix nitrogen from uh, atmospheric nitrogen. So other anim plants and animals aren't able to do that. But uh, cyanobacteria have developed this technique over uh, billions of years. So they can actually pull nitrogen straight from the air. They, the heterocyst, which is that clear uh, ball down at the bottom, it is actually anaerobic. It doesn't allow any oxygen in there, and you, you can't have oxygen 
for nitrogen fixation. So uh, this is a structure where, that they have evolved that allows them to uh, get a usable breakdown atmospheric nitrogen into a usable form of nitrogen that then they can uh, use within themselves for the production of amino acids. The other structure, the akinete, is also called the resting spore. And again, that's for survival. And if we look at uh, the uh, year-round uh, growing season, so here are akinetes on the right-hand side. So in the fall, when the water gets colder, the sunlight diminishes, uh, the filament part breaks down, and the akinetes survive, and they drop down to the bottom of your uh, lake or pond. And then uh, they are full of DNA and a food source that keeps them alive. And not only can they overwinter, but they can survive down in the sediment for many, many years. So once you have uh, these critters, uh, it's something that you're going to have repeatedly and have to uh, take measures for probably every year. Uh, but in the springtime, the uh, akinete starts to sprout and warm up and grow. The gas vesicles inside uh, raise it up to where it gets more light, and then it grows even faster and uh, takes off. So blooms are tricky to predict, even though we can say, oh, you know, it's going to be a warm day. Um, we know there's a lot of phosphorus in the water. Uh, temperature, you know, there's not a rainstorm that's going to flush out the lake. Doesn't actually mean there's going to be a bloom. It's really hard uh, to predict when there's going to uh, be a bloom. So uh, also, not all cyanobacteria cause blooms, and not all cyanobacteria produce cyanotoxins. Uh, and even those cyanobacteria that produce toxins may not even always produce them during bloom conditions. So these are things that you have to test for. So here we have a map of uh, New Jersey last summer. This is from the DEP. These are uh, harmful algal bloom events that they responded to. And the green dots are confirmed uh, cyanobacteria. So you can see they're pretty well spread throughout the state. And um, I'll bet you that big open area where we don't show dots along the coast uh, uh, they probably just didn't have any reported events there. So why do we care about blooms and cyanobacteria? Well, that's because of the cyanotoxins. They have documented impacts on humans, livestock, and pets. Uh, it's a diverse group of chemical substances, and they show very toxic impacts on vertebrates. Some of them are taste and odor compounds, and that's important in uh, uh, reservoirs, drinking water reservoirs. That they can't, uh, they ha they don't want the cyanobacteria because they create a foul odor or odor and taste in the drinking water. And uh, some cyanotoxins don't have any taste, but they have a toxic component. The, the uh, main components are dermatoxins. They irritate your skin if you get the water on your skin. Hepatotoxins, they affect your liver and kidney. And neurotoxins affect the central nervous system. So. 
the primary cyanotoxins that are associated with human health are microcystins, cylindrospermopsin, and anatoxin A. And as you can see, they cause all kinds of nasty things, from just a simple headache, uh, vomiting and nausea, uh, blistering around the mouth, to liver toxicity, um, uh, liver da inflammation and damage, uh, paralysis. So when, when the state is telling you uh, don't go in the water, they have a very good reason for doing so. And if we look at microcystins, uh, the advisory level is three micrograms per liter. That's an infinitesimally small amount of toxin. So uh, it is definitely worth paying attention to the advisories. And let's talk about animals because uh, unfortunately, people seem, while folks may not jump in uh, green water, they tend to not have a problem throwing the ball for their dog into the water. Uh, and every year we have dogs uh, that, that are killed from cyanobacteria. And as you can see where the arrow is, dogs are especially at risk because of their normal behaviors. Uh, they're swimming, they get water in their mouths while they're swimming, uh, they drink the water, they lick their fur. Um, so they actually ingest quite a bit of cyanotoxin if there's a bloom going on. And uh, unfortunately, death can be rather rapid uh, from, uh, you know, in just a few hours uh, for, a, for a dog. Excuse me, Mike? Yep. Can I ask a question real quick? Sure. Other than overuse of fertilizers, is there any other known cause of cyanobacteria? Well, Fertilizers don't cause cyanobacteria. Fertilizers just provide nutrients that the cyanobacteria use to reproduce and, and grow. And if there's too much uh, nutrients in the water, you know, that adds to, uh, helps to create a bloom condition. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So, um, where your dogs or pets are concerned, uh, keep them out of the water. If And uh, I just found this uh, nice little blurb, when in doubt, keep pets out. If that water, like that white dog, that looks like a, uh, that's a nasty cyanobacteria bloom that's going on there. Uh, and that dog, should you should grab him, bring him out, and rinse him off. Uh, and make sure that he isn't able to lick his fur or drink any of that water because uh, there's a high level of cyanobacteria in that. So, but I've seen people, uh, you know, in that Hopkin Pond uh, photo, when I showed up there, there were people throwing their ball for their dog in that emerald green water. And uh, yeah, not that's not good. So, <clears throat> Um, I'm very excited uh, this year uh, because last fall the governor provided a lot of funding for harmful algal bloom work in New Jersey. And besides the three and a half million dollars that have been given out uh, on projects uh, to try and fix lakes and watersheds, uh, money was given to the DEP, Bureau of Freshwater and Marine Monitoring, and they have come up with a, I have to say they've done a, a great job coming up with this super website. And this is just part of it that we're looking at here, this interactive uh, mapping tool, but it's pretty cool because it gives you a ton of information. Well, their whole new website has a ton of information. But let's just look at, you know, if you're interested in an area and that might have um, cyanobacteria. So these dots 
are all color coded now and they tell you where they've responded and if you click on a dot um, it will pop up with this uh, black box and this one happens to be you know down south jersey pick something close to me and uh, this is amico island pond in burlington county so it tells you the location tells you the sample area and it tells you the cell count so this had a really high cell count, 127,000 uh, cells per milliliter. And the dominant cyanobacteria was a phanazomenon, that filament uh, and grass looking uh, critter. So it gives you this information. Now, I, I can't move this bar down, but if you're on the website, you can move that bar down tells you the toxicity level, which uh, at this location, when I looked it up, it was 0.8 micrograms per liter. So um, it was low in toxicity, but it was still present. But then they also have photos of the location where they uh, did the sampling. So a lot of information uh, if you're interested in a particular water body. <laughs> also, and, and I'm going to back up here a second. So, and then on this same page, if we come over here, we have our advisory uh, chart. And let's go that if you click on that, it will open up the page like this. So you can see uh, what's happening. So you can match up those dots. So that Amico Lake was orange. So it's in an advisory um, condition. So it has confirmed uh, cyanobacteria with moderate risk of adverse health effects and increased potential for toxins above public health thresholds. So um, it's got great information there. Uh, it probably doesn't mean anything to you, but it's showing that um, to get to this advisory level, you have confirmed cell counts over 80,000 cells per milliliter, and these are also the toxin levels uh, that trigger uh, that same advisory. Now, uh, I happen to know that that Amico Lake had uh, its issue was with microcystin, so it was under the three micrograms. It was 0 0.08 but it was above the 80,000 uh, cells uh, per milliliter. And the reason uh, that they do that is because this toxin level can change because the toxins are contained within the cells. So if those cells rupture, uh, you know, uh, a bloom does not live all summer long. A bloom, the cells in a bloom live for a week or so and die off. And as they die off, you know, their cells could rupture and they start releasing the toxins. So this toxin level can go up. But this is a great chart uh, that now um, can be used by towns and uh, lake managers to put up these advisory signs that match with those warnings. So uh, they're great, simple signs. They all the different colored signs have the same pictures on them, but they change uh, with um, the toxicity. So you could have green check marks. So boating and fishing is safe, but swimming uh, under a watch, you know, that's the lowest um, advisory level. Uh, swimming, uh, you might want to think about it. But then when you get to the Amico Lake level, you could see nothing where you contact the water um, is advisable. Everything has a red check. And you get down to the danger level and they don't even want you boating on the lake or fishing in the, in the water. So I think these signs are great. Uh, this whole new program uh, is providing a, a 
great amount of information that's easy for the public to understand, and uh, you could really utilize it quite well. If you suspect that a water body is, um, might have a harmful algal bloom, there are only two mechanisms for reporting that to the DEP. Uh, the main thing is to call the DEP hotline and the numbers right here, or uh, download the free mobile app. Hey, Mike. Yeah. Before you get to treatment, just a couple questions. Uh, okay. Somebody asks, are these bacteria, cyanobacteria, anaerobic? If you have flowing or aerated water, is your pond still at risk? Um, yes, your pond is still at risk. But um, as I say, if, you, if it's flowing, uh, it may it doesn't like uh, flowing water, so uh, you know I mean and by flowing I mean the the water actually really moves through it. If your water is sitting there um, any amount of time, um, you know they can still build up. But um, if it's aerated um, and it's aerated to the full depth of the pond, uh, that helps to keep phosphorus locked into the sediment. And we'll have some slides on that later on. Uh, and that's a good thing. So if, you, if it's moving and it's aerated, you're probably in a, in a pretty good condition to not have a bloom. But something to remember is cyanobacteria are everywhere. So there's, it's not like they just appeared overnight. They, they've been here, but conditions have uh, gotten favorable for them to reproduce quickly and, and uh, have these bloom conditions. You know, we've, we've dumped so much material into our water bodies that, you know, uh, we've been feeding them for a couple hundred years now, and, you know, it, we're just seeing the results of uh, all these nutrients building up in the water. Did you have another question, Amy? Yeah, there's a couple more questions. So can you check one part of a lake and get different results in the bathing area? Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So <clears throat> they are not uniform throughout the lake. Uh, there can be hot spots. So if uh, if we use Lake Hapatcon, which I'm sure everybody on this webinar knows about by now after last summer, Lake Hapatcon had um, minor blooms in certain coves for, I, I, I want to say, maybe uh, the five years previous. So you'd there'd be a small bloom in a cove uh, and DEP would respond and they'd document it, but it never really got out of control. <clears throat> so yeah, you can easily have these blooms in isolated areas and then, <clears throat> then they can spread out from there. Also, they they're a plankton, so they, they don't swim. They don't have a mechanism for swimming on their own. They just move by the currents, and uh, the wind drives them a lot. So if they come up to the surface and you have <coughs> a west wind blowing, uh, that's pushing all that scum layer over to the eastern shore. So the western shore might uh, be nice and uh, appear to be nice and clean. People are swimming in it, but then over on the eastern shore, there's a a thick paint scum layer uh, that you know just looks super nasty. So yeah, you um, it's very spotty, and they also can appear 
at certain parts of the day and then disappear. Because remember, they can regulate their buoyancy. So you might see a big bloom, um, say at 10 a.m., and you come back at 2, and you don't see anything. It doesn't. The water looks fine because the cyanobacteria have dropped down three feet. Okay, two more questions before you go. Why is it called a harmful algal bloom since you said it's not algae? <laughs> I do not know. So <laughs> oh, I, I, sus I suspect because um, he, somebody at uh, or people decided that was a easier way to talk to people about it, saying harmful algal bloom uh, instead of cyanobacteria. So, yeah, I because <laughs> I, I think that's that's my guess. But it's it's a shame because you know, like all this work that's going on now, all this money, uh, you know, this DEP's new website, they talk about a harmful algal bloom, but in reality, they're only talking about cyanobacteria. Right. Okay. Thank you for clearing that up. Now, one more very... Well, actually, you know, oh, go ahead. just because I've, I'm interested in the cyanobacteria, there's probably some harmful algae that they work with too, but I'm, uh, I'm not familiar with that part of their, their work. Okay. Uh, now, here's an interesting question. Can HABs or harmful algal blooms be used as a renewable energy fuel? If so, what is New Jersey doing to harvest this bacteria and use it for such? I'm pretty sure nobody has uh, looked at that. I don't know that it, uh, no idea there. I don't know how you would, um, It's it, yeah, I don't know how you'd, uh, you deal with that. Someone uh, way smarter than me would have to uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> would have to know how to process it. I, I think at this point they're they're more concerned with trying to keep it out of lakes and ponds and drinking water supplies. Um, but no, I, I I think that duckweed has a much better potential. It's not life-threatening, it doesn't hurt you, you can eat it, you can get, uh, make fuels out of it. So, and okay. it and it grows just about as fast. So yeah, go duckweed. Okay, one, I'm sorry, one more question and then we'll let you go. I won't skip these, <laughs> so there's a bunch of questions, but we'll let you finish. So are these blooms different than red tides? Yes. So, um, so red tides uh, are um, from another planktonic critter. Um, uh, Goniolix is uh, one of the main contributors uh, of that. And uh, boy, I tell you, and I'm, I'm drawing a blank at what what class of of critter. Um, what? What was it? No, what's Goniolix? Gonoflagellates. It's a good thing I have my wife sitting at the, the dining room table. So red tides are uh, from dinoflagellates, uh, another planktonic critter. They can actually move, too. They have a flagella that whips around. And they, I believe, uh, the red tides produce a saxitoxin. Um, so yeah, they're they're different organisms altogether. Okay, why don't you go on and we'll get questions at the end. Okay. Thank you. All right, so <laughs> let's let's look at some treatment options. And so here you can see another. This is microcystis again. Uh, I, how it. Uh, is building and moving with the uh, water currents. This is all uh, about an inch to two under the surface. 
just a little background on that. So a um, person earlier asked a question about um, the lake or water moving through. So here's what happens in a lot of lakes. And, and the lake I work at, with, at Hopkins Pond, is a prime example of this. So in the summertime, you, if your lake is deep enough, then um, probably needs to be at least eight feet or eight to 10 feet deep. Um, Hopkins Pond is uh, not that big, but it's about 14 feet deep. And uh, as the summer sun warms the surface of the lake, uh, the lake starts to break up into these layers. And it has a, a less dense surface layer because the water, uh, the properties of water make it less dense when it gets warm. It rises, stays at the surface. And then the bottom is colder and it doesn't have a chance to get up to the surface because it's denser. It stays at the bottom. And in between, you get this transition zone called a thermocline. And if you've ever been in a, a, a real lake where you dive down and you go down about eight feet or so underwater, you actually feel the temperature change. The same thing in the ocean. Um, there's a, a thermocline in the ocean. So this cold, dense layer at the bottom, it doesn't have a chance to get up to the surface to get oxygen. Because in the lake, that's really where a lot of your oxygen comes from, is up at the surface. And it uh, just uh, picks up oxygen uh, from the air. But your hypolimnion, this cold, dense layer, never has a chance to get up there. So it goes anaerobic. All the bacteria and critters, leftover critters down in there, they use up the oxygen. The oxygen's all gone. And what happens then is all this phosphorus that's been building up in the bottom of the, of the lake, because phosphorus binds to sediment when there's oxygen available, and it sinks down to the bottom. But when it goes anaerobic, the bonds of the phosphorus and the sediment break apart, and it releases the phosphorus into the water. So if something happens to stir that water a bit so that phosphorus can move up, then that helps to uh, have a bloom in your lake. So there are some things that uh, we can do to adjust for that. So um, an air diffuser, if you have a, a small water body, you could put an air diffuser on the bottom and the bubbles come up to the surface, and as the bubbles rise up and they expand, uh, they create a vacuum behind them, and that pulls the water from the bottom up to the surface. It spreads out over the surface, and it picks up oxygen, and then moves out to the side and starts cooling off and drops down and back to the bottom. So what you're doing is you're actually uh, oxygenating the whole water column. And so now uh, if we go back here, you can see in this standard situation, the fish are only right up at the surface where there's oxygen. And But if we mix that uh, water in the lake, we break down that stratification now the fish can use the entire water body. Uh, here's what they look like in, in real life. Uh, they put out tons of these small bubbles. And as the bubbles move up, they expand. And it, it works very effectively. And the nice thing about these systems is they're very cheap to operate. They, you just use a little bitty uh, quarter horse compressor, um, at least for a five acre, say, pond. Uh, 
And all they're doing is pumping air, and air doesn't have any weight. So to run these, it's very inexpensive. Uh, you, uh, you do have to lay out these airlines out into the lake. And this is what it looks like. This is Hopkins Pond with the aerators installed. And the nice thing about this is it's quiet. Uh, it doesn't bother people. They still have the solitude walking the trails around the lake. And the whole water column has become oxygenated. And the level of the uh, phosphorus within the lake dropped dramatically, dropped down to the state level. Um, so it was a good thing. There are many different types of equipment that can be used to uh, do similar things. Uh, this one sucks water up. It has like an auger in the middle, and it only goes down to where the thermocline is, and it's uh, solar powered. This auger spins inside. It pulls the water up and out. So this is doing really the same thing that uh, the air bubbles were doing. And indeed, there are um, structures that look just like this, where they pump air at the bottom, the air rises up, and it does the same thing. But this sets up good uh, oxygenation, a, a good turning over in that upper level of water. If you wanted to go down into the, and oxygenate this bottom, you can extend uh, this device, add pieces to it so it goes all the way down to the bottom, and then it would be exactly like uh, an aeration system. <laughs> so uh, this is another, uh, I actually just installed this in Hopkins Pond last year, and because even though we were able to reduce the level of phosphorus down to the state level. It didn't stop the blooms in the lake. And while we were getting frustrated at what to do, um, we decided to try this ultrasonic transducer. And it sends out a very high frequency sound wave. And what that does is it actually disrupts the swim bladder, the buoyancy compensator, uh, the, <coughs> the buoyancy vacuole of the cyanobacteria. And so they can't uh, regulate themselves in the water column, and they sink down to the bottom out of the sunlight, and then they die. And this was extremely effective for us last year. Um, we, we hadn't had water quality that good um, since we started working on the pond about eight years ago. So we uh, have it in place and on again this year so we can uh, record what's happening. But it's, uh, this seems like a, a really good system. Uh, but you do have to be careful. There are some systems out there that uh, blast a noise like a jet engine and can harm other critters in the water. Uh, this particular system we use is a lower level. And I've been doing zooplankton studies out there, and there's uh, uh, lots of zooplankton, and it uh, doesn't seem to be uh, disruptive to them at all. Uh, now we're going to talk about chemical treatments, which are, are pretty commonly used. Now, one number one, if you want to use a chemical in a lake, that is a permanent activity. You need to have a certified applicator. Uh, you have to file permits with the state and use approved products. It's not a uh, overnight uh, job. It's something that takes probably 
a uh, couple months anyway to get the approvals. Uh, you have to do public notifications. Um, and it's all uh, really designed so that the chemicals are used properly and you're not doing more harm than good. So uh, a lot of these products are copper-based. Copper is toxic to a lot of aquatic organisms. Uh, but then there are some oxidizers that use hydrogen peroxide as, uh, as the main chemical. Uh, but both of these are effective. Uh, they can control uh, nuisance densities uh, rather quickly. And if you look at the costs uh, in a square foot type of uh, application, it's, it, they're relatively low cost because you can, it might cost you $400 for a gallon of this material, but that gallon uh, treats um, you know, multiple acres. So, um, and now there doesn't mean there aren't issues with chemical control and copper-based products can cause a release of cyanotoxins. So they tend, the, the copper products tend to rupture the uh, cyanobacterial cells uh, where the cyanotoxins are stored. So if you have a bloom, you definitely do not want to use the copper-based product because you're going to uh, kill all those cyanobacteria, rupture all those cell walls, and release all their toxins at one time into the water column. So it's one thing if they slowly die off and are releasing their toxins and hopefully flowing through the water, uh, it's another thing if you uh, kill them and release that toxin all at one time. Uh, that can, you can end up with fish kills and real water quality problems. Um, the other thing is uh, they are often only a short duration of improvement that the algae or, or cyanobacteria can rebound uh, if the conditions are still warm calm water with high nutrients, uh, cyanobacteria reproduce very rapidly and they can come back a few weeks later. Uh, you can also get secondary blooms from other algae that you weren't treating for. Um, and one of the big issues with copper is that it accumulates in the sediments and uh, there's a lot of uh, people that have issues with that and what does that mean uh, down the road for your water body. Um, excuse me, Mike. Yeah. Yep. I'm going to start the poll. So okay. Everyone can um, tell us what they've been learning and what they plan to do. Um, so let's get this going. And I have opened the poll. If you can't see the poll, click on the arrow all the way to the right in the top right and polling should come up. Uh, you'll have 20 minutes to complete the poll. I see some of you are already taking it, so thank you for that. And I will allow Mike to finish here. Let me make you presenter again. Hold on, Mike. I lost okay. the presenter. Um, here we go. I, need, I needed to become presenter to start the poll, and now I'll make you presenter again. Oh, close the open poll, then change the presenter. Never mind. Uh, so tell me when to move the slide. How about that? <laughs> oh, oh, you have to move the slide? Yeah, okay. sorry about yeah. that. Yeah, if anybody has any questions on the poll, I've got the answers right here. I'm looking at them so you can just ask. No cheating. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yes, uh, please, uh, next slide. Okay. Um, so. Hydrogen peroxide, I mentioned, is an, another treatment. It's a very strong oxidant, um, moderately priced. And uh, the nice thing about it is it's low toxicity for non-target species. And one of the great advantages it has over copper is that it breaks down to water and hydrogen. 
The only problem with it is if your lake has a lot of organic material in it uh, to start, that it may react so quickly it doesn't get the job done uh, the first time. So uh, you may need to use more of the product. Okay, Amy. So um, now we're going to talk about phosphorus binding material. So uh, this is alum and phoslock, and, and there are a couple other things that are used, but alum and phoslock are the, uh, the main ingredients. So alum is aluminum sulfate, phoslock is a, a lanthium and uh, bentonite clay uh, product. And here they are. This this happened uh, uh, just uh, what I guess a couple weeks ago up at Lake Opacon. This is uh, Princeton Hydro spreading phoslock out into the lake. So they uh, were awarded a grant to treat 50 acres of the lake. And you can see it goes out. It settles through the water column. And Amy, if you'd switch to the next slide, so. We look on the left, there's the blue dots are phosphorus, and that and we call it free reactive phosphorus. For, so that's the type of phosphorus that uh, plants, algae, uh, cyanobacteria can use to reproduce with. And then uh, during the phoslock or alum application, which is the yellow dots, you spread it at the surface and it sinks to the bottom, and as it sinks down, it binds with the phosphorus in the water column and carries it down to the bottom sediment and it locks it up permanently down in there. So it does a great job for uh, the, uh, the water column. What it doesn't do is um, once it's settled down, it doesn't really remove um, any new phosphorus that enters the water column. So uh, it will be interesting to see what happens at Lake Hopatcong in that area because uh, at, they treated 50 acres, but that's only 2% of the lake size. The lake, it's 2,500 uh, acres. And all that other 2,450 acres uh, the phosphorus in that is free to move around and could come right back in uh, to that 50 acre location. So we'll we'll see what happens. But if you can treat a a whole water body with this material, it does a, a really good job at removing uh, phosphorus. <clears throat> okay, Amy. All right. So other plants that may be mistaken for cyanobacteria. So uh, go ahead, Amy. So, um, water meal. Uh, take a look at this. This looks like, like our floating pond scum, and uh, the uh, the paint. This looks just like the paint layer uh, that we talk about with cyanobacteria. And the other thing I want you to look out for, look at is uh, that fountain. So, a lot of places, they they. Uh, put in fountains because they're told, oh, this will control water quality, this will control the algae in your lake. But um, as you can see here and in the slide later on, uh, fountains are really terrible uh, at controlling uh, algae or cyanobacteria in lakes. And also, they pump water, which is eight pounds per gallon. So it takes a lot of energy. It's very expensive to run a fountain. Uh, so uh, you can see uh, I lean towards the aeration system, underwater aeration, uh, which is much cheaper to operate, much lower cost. OK, Amy. And here we have a close up of this same area. So the bigger picture, that is the water meal. And the inset is. Microcystis, this cyanobacteria. So um, they look very similar. And when I saw this, uh, this is Newton Lake in Collingswood. 
uh, I was sure that this was a cyanobacteria bloom. Okay, Amy, um, until I did this. Uh, and I don't recommend you sticking your uh, finger in <clears throat> into that stuff. Uh, use a stick instead. <clears throat> but what's actually happening was that was the largest bloom of water meal I've ever seen, but all of those individual little specks are teeny tiny flowering plants. And uh, so the only problem they cause for uh, the water quality is they block the sunlight from getting down to any aquatic vegetation underneath them. Okay, Amy. Uh, and now this is filamentous or mat algae. It can form uh, dense layers across the surface. And it, the problem with it is, is blocking sunlight uh, from getting down into the water column for other plants, similar to the water meal. And also uh, during the night, it uses up, it needs uh, oxygen in the water to respire with during the night. And it can, when it's this dense, it can actually suck so much oxygen out of the water that you have fish kills. Okay, Amy. And here is another example of a fountain um, not cleaning up. Uh, this fountain was specifically installed to remove uh, filamentous algae. And you can see that uh, the only spot that doesn't have it is uh, where the water lands, or the, yeah, the water lands on the lake surface. Okay, Amy. Um, so uh, if you want to monitor and check toxic levels of cyanobacteria in a water body, uh, they have a number uh, of ways to do it. On the left, we have the abraxic test strips. Now that company, Abraxas, is the only one that makes these test strips, and you have to buy them in like uh, packs of 10, they're like $400, so um, it's not cheap. And uh, it only takes about 40 minutes to get a measurement from that. So a lot of bathing beach management areas uh, will use that. Uh, what I've found, I, I ran a test I split samples with uh, the DEP at Hopkins Pond. We ran this test, and pretty much what I found is uh, if the water looks green, you get a positive test. If the water doesn't look green, you don't get a positive test. So uh, that's kind of been uh, uh, my take on using those strips. Uh, so if we go to number three, that's actually a ELISA chemical test. So this is back in your lab. Uh, this is a small unit. This isn't the full-size commercial laboratory unit, uh, but they could have something similar to this. That's actually the DEP's unit right there uh, that, uh, that they use. Uh, so you really need to collect a water sample and send it off for analysis if you want to know what the toxic uh, toxicity is in your water body. Okay, um, so what can people do to help? So we really need to keep uh, nutrients out of the water. So we already have water uh, nutrients in the water, and it's hard hard to deal with what's already there. We've had a couple hundred years of that building up, but we don't want to add anything more. So. Please, when you're using fertilizers on your yard, don't overdo it. Just use um, the recommended amount. You uh, want it to go into the soil and not to run off. Uh, for around your dwellings, uh, practice good stormwater management. Use uh, green infrastructure uh, techniques, rainwater harvesting, rain gardens, vegetated swales, pervious payment. Uh, there's a lot of things coming out now. The DEP has new rules that require green infrastructure for new development. So we're 
moving or making great strides in the state, um, trying to handle our stormwater runoff. And if you're in an uh, own a septic uh, tank, septic field, uh, make sure you know how to manage that properly uh, to pre prevent nutrient seepage into nearby water bodies. Because remember, yeah, what you flush into a septic field, it's going somewhere and it's going down and it is making its way to the uh, uh, groundwater and then traveling from there. So it, make sure that you uh, are doing the best job you can at managing your septic field. Okay, Amy, there we go. Now we're, uh, we could take any more questions. Excellent. So I just want to remind everyone, please take a poll. I see some people are in progress. Um, you have about seven minutes left. Again, the poll is on the right-hand side. There's an arrow. And so if you don't see the poll, click on the very right, top right, arrow and polling should come up as a an option and click on that and you should see the poll. Uh, I know some people were having trouble seeing it in the chat, but there are lots of questions, Mike. Uh, so this, okay, hold on, let me go, go back. I didn't want to interrupt you, but I wanted you to get through your presentation. Um, now that we're here, um, people want to know, uh, let's see. Is there any way to prevent cyanobacteria before they occur, or do you have to wait until they occur and then install these uh, treatment options? Well, if you um, haven't had any bloom issues before, um, then you know you're in hopefully in good shape. You would want to uh, monitor your water quality. And that will tell you if uh, there's something, if you need to be watching out for this. You know, what are your levels of phosphorus? What are the levels of nitrogen in the water? Um, you know, if your levels of phosphorus are going ab above 0.05, uh, then, you know, you, it's something that uh, you want to, you know, pay attention to. You could do... Uh, uh, maybe work with a local university uh, and do some plankton toes in your water body and see if you have uh, or what types of cyanobacteria you have in your, your pond. Um, um, so those things, you know, understanding your the nutrient levels in the pond, understanding, uh, you know, the depth of your pond, do you, does it stratify, which releases nutrients uh, uh, during the summer. Um, so coming up with, at, you don't need to have a full-blown lake management plan, but if you have something small that you could uh, get some of the basic data and know what you're dealing with, that goes a long way to, to predicting if you're gonna have an issue. Okay. Uh, now, here's a question. If a brook-fed dammed pond gets a bloom, is the brook downstream of the spillway potentially toxic even though it is flowing? Sure, because um, the, toxic, the, the toxins are, are water-soluble, so they could flow out over the dam and downstream. But oh. they would keep, I mean, they, they would keep moving, so at, at, uh, eventually, you know, when the lake clears up, the water flowing over it would uh, clear up, and you know, it basically is flushing the problem downstream. Gotcha. Okay, so now getting to the treatment. With ultrasonic, do you have to adjust the wavelength? I've heard cyanobacteria can adjust to constant wavelength. Um, I have not heard that. I don't. Uh, I haven't had any issues in, in in the year and a half I've been working with uh, this unit. I think I don't think an individual species can adjust, and 
and that's just me talking. But I, I do believe that different species um, are affected by different frequencies. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, thank you. So this person has a question about the FOSLOC. Does the FOSLOC eventually degrade? Um, it actually um, stays pretty, it makes a layer at the bottom and it doesn't really degrade. But what can happen is, do you have a lot of carp in your pond or lake? Because carp are bottom feeders, they go uh, slurping around on the bottom so they can break up that uh, phospholock layer. It takes a, can take a while, but you know, if you have a lot of carp, they can um, tear that up and, um, and you would want to re reapply it. You, if you have, the other thing is, again, the phospholock or the alum, uh, they both work the same way. And once they've settled on the bottom and they create this layer, they don't affect any new phosphorus that's washing into your water body. So that's why we we really stress that you need to try and figure out where your sources of phosphorus are coming from and correct them before they get into the water body. Because uh, well, phospholock is very expensive to apply, uh, and, but it has the advantage that it doesn't change the pH of the water, whereas alum uh, makes uh, the water body more acidic. So you have to uh, do a, a laboratory test of your water and sediments before you apply alum to make sure that you're not going to make that water too acidic and have an effect on the the plant and animal life in the in the lake. Okay, a couple more questions. How frequent are fish kills due to cyanobacteria? I don't actually know. Um, I have um, well, the pond I have where I initially went, we had a fish kill. Um, I haven't had a fish kill since. Uh, but after that first year, we significantly reduced the level of cyanobacteria that was uh, that would bloom in the lake. Again, we didn't with the aeration we we couldn't remove it all, but we made it so that I'll say it was habitable for the fish, and um, we actually even stocked. Uh, some largemouth bass in there, and um, there was no uh, dead bass, uh, no, no fish kills that came after it. Uh, so I don't know if you're, it, I think it just all depends on how thick and uh, your cyanobacteria is, and if you have a, a big enough bloom that it can actually uh, shut um, use up all that oxygen during the night uh, because they produce oxygen during the day, but again, they use oxygen during the night just like algae. Um, so I don't know what the, how many fish kills there are in New Jersey. That's kind of an interesting question to, have to ask the DEP. That's not something I've seen on their website. Okay. Um, can you address the link between cyanobacteria and Parkinson's disease? Uh, no, I have no, I have never, never heard of that. So I, I don't, I don't know anything about that. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, what is meant by proper septic tank maintenance? Um, that's what the uh, EPA puts out on their information, and I have to tell you, I don't have a septic tank, and I don't know uh, really what's involved. I know there's, in New Jersey, there's a recommendation of uh, pumping uh, your septic tank 
what is it, every three years, I think, uh, so that it doesn't uh, overflow the solids into your leach field. But yeah, I'm not a septic tank, uh, septic field person. Sorry. Okay. Um, any comments about the use of triploid? Oh, carp? I don't know. I guess I don't know that term. Is triploid a carp? Well, they have triploid uh, carp um, that they use to uh, eat certain types of aquatic algae and plants. Okay. Uh, they're uh, they're called grass carp, and uh, it's something that's highly regulated by the DEP. Uh, you have to apply uh, to do that to add it into your water column or your water body. Uh, they you have to ensure that there's no way they can escape. Um, you know, so they don't like to approve them. I know that. Um, the other thing is, they don't eat cyanobacteria, nope. so it's not going to be a help there. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, what are the long-term effects of using the alum and FOSLOC treatments? Um, there have been, uh, well, I think they're constantly debating uh, alum because of the aluminum in it. And does that create an issue down the road? Uh, you know, the, uh, you know, I think there are some people that say, well, there's a potential for uh, aluminum toxicity in the water body. Uh, the uh, NALMS, the uh, National Lake Management Society, uh, they have a publication where they've concluded that the use of alum is not um, a problem and not going to create a problem. Uh, FOSLOC uh, is pretty much inert, so it's not an issue at all. Okay, thank you. It's just a lot more money. <laughs> Isn't it always? Yeah. Um, okay. Are there any models used by DEP or EPA to forecast potential HAB occurrences for lakes based on environmental factors like lack of rain, nutrient loadings, et cetera? Um, the, uh, as far as I know, the, the DEP is not using any type of model. I, I don't, I think that is way beyond them at this point. Um, they really have only gotten into the um, cyanobacteria game maybe six years ago. So this is all evolving very rapidly for them. And uh, I think that the last year's huge numbers of lakes and important lakes, uh, it just really hammered them. Um, so I'm impressed with what they've done with their website, the way they're uh, putting out a ton of information. Uh, they're parsing it out in ways that people can understand. And I think that's an excellent start. And I'm sure that they are scrambling to do whatever they can. And if it involves a model, um, I'm sure that they will uh, be looking into that probably through their division of science and research. But no, I don't know of any predictive models. EPA would be more likely to be doing that right now, but I don't know of any. Okay. Uh, is there any natural predator to cyanobacteria? Now, they, that's one of the issues. Because they're toxic, they tend to not be tasty. Um, so there's not a lot that eats them. It's more, I think they get ingested more by uh, chance by filter feeders than uh, actively preyed upon. 
an interesting thing uh, is uh, Daphnia, the water flea, which is a zooplankton and a good food source for uh, larval fish. Uh, if they eat cyanobacteria, they tend to be a little smaller. They don't reproduce in as big a number, but they are healthier. They, the cyanobacteria actually seems to be protecting them from certain viruses that other Daphnia that don't eat the cyanobacteria uh, that seem that are bigger and seem healthier actually succumb to the viruses. So that's interesting. Yeah. Okay, one last question, and then we're going to wrap this up. Everyone's been great. These are great questions. So do you know, is there a difference between New Jersey and New York standards? Didn't Greenwood Lake have a HAB according to New Jersey standards, but not according to New York? Yes. Yes. Yes, there was, uh, uh, there was, there was a little bit of, I think, tension there between states because, uh, yeah, the New York standards uh, um, and New York did not want to do certain uh, things uh, to shut down their portion of Greenwood Lake, whereas New Jersey, um, you know, was quite adamant that, um, you know, it, it needed to be, should be shut down. So yes, the, not all states, um, have the same uh, requirements or the same, uh, use the same guidance. So it's, which is kind of a shame. Okay, well, thank you, Mike. That was very informative. Um, we really appreciate you hanging in for all those questions. Uh, thank you everyone for attending. This is the last of our Earth Day at home webinar series for this summer. We are planning a fall series, so check your email. Uh, we will be working on the schedule shortly. Thank you so much for, for tuning in and for checking us out. And we really appreciate everybody coming in and listening. And uh, we would love to, to hear feedback. Or you can donate at our Environmental Stewards webpage, as we were discussing. And uh, thank you so much, Mike. That was a great presentation. Thanks for, for being last but not least. <laughs> and uh, we will see how things go in the fall. But thank you, everybody. And I am going to turn off the recorder before I forget.